Hello and welcome to the Mindful Life chat series via, well, me, Waylon Lewis of Elephant Journal. Today we're going to talk about love. Love is a huge thing in every song, in our culture, in every movie, every other movie that doesn't involve zombies, and probably a couple zombie movies as well. And I wanted to do this reading partially because it's Valentine's Day, but what I want to talk about is the Buddhist perspective on true love and finding it. So that hopefully is applicable all year long. I'm going to do two readings. The first one I'll do first is called Valentine's Day Isn't for Lovers. And it's something I wrote way back in the day, back in 2011, the pre-Trump era. And I'll just read a little bit here. It's from myself and from Suzuki Roshi, a much wiser individual. So I'll begin with this, and then I'll discuss a bit uh, and make it more applicable and kind of try to dial it in so it's helpful for your life. So today I wanted to particularly basically focus on the, uh, the three subject of love, loneliness, and boredom, and how they connect. So here it is. Valentine's Day isn't for lovers. It's for all of us who love, excuse me, take two. Valentine's Day isn't for lovers, it's for all those who love, and that's all of us. This is a quote. One morning as we were all sitting zazen, meditation, silently in the zendo, meditation hall, Suzuki Roshi said, don't move, just die over and over. Don't anticipate, nothing can save you now, because this is your last moment. Not even enlightenment will help you now because you have no other moments with no future. Be true to yourself and don't move. Love hurts. Valentine's Day isn't for lovers, it's for all those who love, and that's all of us. The flip side of love is loss. Even as we fall in love, we feel loss coming. Shunru Suzuki Roshi talked about dying in every moment. This isn't a bad thing. This feeling of being haunted by impermanence is what makes love real, sweet, heartbreaking, tender, open, raw, vulnerable, and precious. Even for those who fall in love in high school and get married and live happily ever after, their love begins anew each morning, each moment. Love is a practice, much like meditation, and just like meditation, I and many others are really bad at it. A year back, I wrote about one of my favorite poets, Pablo Neruda, in one of his great poems, and I thought of it again today. Valentine's Day, like Christmas, is happy for many and miserable for those who feel as if we're outside looking in. So it's a good time to remember that we're all lonely. Loneliness in the Buddhist tradition is considered a good thing. I'll repeat that. So it's a good time to remember that we're all lonely. Loneliness in the Buddhist tradition is considered a good thing. The hard part, as Neruda reminds us, is letting go. Letting go sucks. Letting go isn't pretty. Letting go ain't sad. Sometimes it's bad. Letting go isn't about birds and cages and things coming back if they truly love you. Letting go is about heartburn, claustrophobia, heartache, angst, growling. Letting go is about needing, needing happy music. Old 1950s, how do you like your eggs in the morning with Dino or green sleeves? in the morning because you're so sad and bitter you can't breathe oxygen you haven't breathed in days letting go is about the anger right before you open up and hug a friend and get their shoulder wet and salty it reminds me of this poem i used to love neruda back in college i can write the saddest poem of all tonight write for instance the night is full of stars and the stars blue shiver in the distance the night wind whirls in the sky and sings. I can write the saddest poem of all tonight. I loved her and sometimes she loved me too. On nights like this, I held her in my arms. I kissed her so many times under the infinite sky. She loved me. Sometimes I loved her. How could I have not loved her large, still eyes? I can write the saddest poem of all tonight. To think I don't have her. To feel that I've lost her. To hear the immense night more immense without her, and the poem falls to the soul as dew to grass. What does it matter that my love couldn't keep her? The night is full of stars, and she is not with me. 
that's all. Far away as someone sings, far away. My soul is lost without her. As if to bring her near, my eyes search for her. My heart searches for her, and she is not with me. The same night that whitens the same trees, we, we who were, we are the same no longer. I no longer love her, true, but how much I loved her. My voice searched the wind to touch her ear. Someone else's, she will be someone else's, as she once belonged to my kisses. Her voice, her light body, her infinite eyes. I no longer love her, true, but perhaps I love her. Love is so short and oblivion so long. Because on nights like this, I hold her in my arms, my soul is lost without her. Although this may be the last pain she causes me, and this may be the last poem I write for her. That's the end of the poem. There is a Buddhist meditation practice for working with anger or sadness or loss or things falling apart. Essentially, it keeps things flowing through you instead of getting stuck and viewing the emotions as solid or life or self-confirming. It works against our ego's tendency, which is always to cling to pleasure and push away pain, even when reality is painful and pleasure is fleeting. Ironically, our ego's tendency tends to keep us cycling through dissatisfaction, disharmony, and self-centered turmoil. In other words, in trying to be happy, we make ourselves miserable. And one winds up not letting go at all, but just adding fuel to the neurotic fire called samsara, or confusion, in the Buddhist tradition. The practice that, in my limited experience, works best as a tonic for sadness or madness is called tonglen, or sending and taking practice. So I don't wish you a happy Valentine's Day. I wish you a genuine Valentine's Day. Feel what you feel. If you feel happy, know that you are loved and lucky and that everything is impermanent and that sadness will help you love all the more. If you are lonely, know that you're not alone. So that's my little writing on uh, Valentine's Day. And if you're interested in the Tonglen meditation practice, you could look on Elephant Journal for videos and uh, more thoughtful instruction. Or, as always, it's best to get it in person. So the connection of loneliness to love... I mean, loneliness to love and loneliness to boredom and boredom to love and boredom to loneliness, etc., is important. In our society, it's the number one article in the New York Times right now. In our society, we do everything we can to avoid boredom. We have our phones. We listen to music in the car. Trung Primshe, my parents' Buddhist teacher, used to say, the only times Americans ever do nothing the only time we ever do nothing as a culture is when we sit in the passenger seat of a car. But now, of course, we have our phones in the passenger seat. If you're in the back seat, you have movies often. You have your iPad. You have your music. And you have, you know, radio or conversation. None of those things are bad. Buddhism isn't about, you know, giving you new reasons to guilt trip yourself. But what is kind of bad or unhealthy for us is our inability to be bored and relax into that boredom. In the Buddhist tradition, there's a hot boredom and cool boredom. Hot boredom is that feeling like when you're in a sauna for a few minutes, maybe a few minutes too long, and you want to get out. You're uncomfortable. You can't just relax and do nothing. Cool boredom is that feeling when you're exhausted, maybe you've had a good cry, maybe you're having an incredible piece of fruit, or bread in Paris, or coffee, and you're just really present and enjoying the hell out of it. So that's the feeling of cool boredom. You get to cool boredom, which is where I think all of us want to be, completely present and appreciative in a kind of tender way. Not in a gluttonous way, but in a kind of appreciative way. You get to that cool boredom through hot boredom. And you get to hot through hot boredom by being willing to stick with it and relax with it. When I had meditation instructors back when I was a kid, I still do. I go see one every couple weeks. But when I was a kid, it was terrifying. I would walk into the room, I would sit down with them, and they would just stare at me kind of pleasantly and openly and vacantly. And they wouldn't say anything. 
meditation instruction is not therapy, it's not life coaching. They're not there to be helpful particularly, they're there to create space for you to share how your practice is going. So I would walk in, I'd be 15, I'd be 12, I'd be whatever, and they wouldn't say anything and I'd look at them and I'd just have to fill the space. I'm still like that today. For all my practice and talking about loneliness and boredom and meditation, and mindfulness, I'm as speedy or speedier than any of you. And I think that's a key point, is that this isn't about being the Buddha. This isn't about being perfect. You can leave your perfectionism behind. You don't have to get rid of it. You don't have to hate it. But you have to kind of make friends with it and realize that perfectionism won't help you be perfect. Um, perfectionism is an obstacle to being, quote-unquote, perfect, to doing a good job. So... Um, so, if we can make friends with boredom, then we can relax into our hearts. We can begin to breathe. We can begin to be present. And that, of course, is the ground of falling in love, of a genuine kind of falling in love that isn't built on fantasy, on attraction, that is, that is something more and something deeper, and something where we can get through the hard parts. When you fall in love... Falling in love is not love. Falling in love is fun and exciting and magical. But the first time you're arguing about doing the dishes or you're arguing about something stupid and you have to get through that, that's where falling in love can turn into something bigger or deeper called love. And loneliness is the ground of all of this. We're born alone. We die alone. We marry alone. Even when you're making love, you're alone. The space for romance, the space for passion, that space is loneliness, and it's something we don't have to get rid of. Some of you are more comfortable calling it aloneness. Whatever you want to call it, our culture is also built on trying to get rid of it. But loneliness is the ground of all great love songs, all great love poetry. Loneliness is, is something... Uh, that we can make friends with. And um, when you're friends with yourself, there's nowhere in the world you could go. You could travel the whole world and you'd be with your best friend the entire time, who is yourself. So when then you fall in love, then you're not codependent. Maybe you need them. Maybe you love them. Maybe you want them. But you also can work through things on your own. There's an independence, which gives rise to a sense of humor about difficulty. And a kind of uh, willingness to be empathetic because you're, you've learned to be empathetic with yourself first. So right now, the last couple months, I've been falling in love, which is always fun. And it's been long distance uh, for the most part. So it's really forced me to go slowly and get to know her really well. Instead of just falling in love and having tons of sex and deciding whether we're going to live together and deciding if we're going to get married and having a fight or two along the way and then breaking up, uh, we've been forced by the distance to just get to know each other really thoroughly. We talk for an hour or two or three a day on the phone or video. We write each other all the time, all the time, uh, texting mostly, but messaging all the time. And uh, we also don't message all the time. There's some gaps in space and just living our own lives. And I think that's been a wonderful ground. As I write about in my book, Things I Would Like to Do With You, um, I would like to remember that you and I, we began things properly, slowly, deliberately, in the old way, as if we meant it. So I'm going to offer a little reading, partially because it's Valentine's Day and partially because this chapter fits the theme, which is love, loneliness, and boredom. So in Scarface, which is like the samsaric, the confused, the egotistical, the aggressive version of how to kind of grow up in life, there's this great line where he says, first you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the woman. But in Buddhism or mindfulness, first you make friends with loneliness, then you make friends with boredom, then you're ready for love. So here is from Things I Would Like to Do With You. A short reading from chapter 8 titled, Things I Would Like to Do With You When You Visit My Home. And this lady I've uh, fallen in love with, 
uh, is visiting my home tomorrow night for her first visit. So in honor of that and in honor of you, here's a quote from Bell Hooks, lowercase. Knowing how to be solitary is central to the art of loving. When we can be alone, we can be with others without using them as a means of escape. Knowing how to be solitary is central to the art of loving. When we can be alone, we can be with others without using them as a means of escape. Bell hooks. And here's the chapter. I would like to see you. It has now been too long. I saw you last month and four days ago and a year ago exactly. Then I was flooded and now I am parched. I would like to see you in just a few days when you arrive at my door and like children arriving for their first day of school, we will giddily greet this unknown new present with sweet shaky smiles. You will have arrived from no place, no home now but the road, driving from your old ocean home to our old forest home, to her home, to my home in this flooded mountain valley, and then on into your future. Where is home? Your visit will not be long enough, which is the perfect length, unless it is too long, even better. We can do whatever we like. Perhaps we can eat at my favorite table at a favorite restaurant. I like it because it is outside, but shaded, so I can see the sunshine as I work away my life on my laptop. I like it because it is a big table from which I can see life pass me by on the sidewalk. And I like it because the big table is hidden so I can work without too many folks stopping chatting at me. We can get dark kale chips all over our teeth. We can eat a big salad or garlic potatoes with Dijon and drink well-sourced seven minute black coffee or kegged white wine and a local lager because there is nothing hobby. Perhaps, if I am feeling better, we can run up and around and down the mountains in the morning with Red Dog. Or I would like you to drive me into the mountains. If we can find mountain roads that are open and dry, and we can get lost at 14,000 feet and see the lakes reflect the heavens. The air is so clear up there. Oh, perhaps, or perhaps I can take you climbing. We will bike along the bike path, or we can play pool and drink good beer in a dark bar, or perhaps we can see good friends on the damp lawn on Saturday morning at Farmer's Market. Or perhaps we can drive to Cow City and visit a hipster dinner spot I love, or we can walk a museum, or go to a fundraiser, or film, or cook at home and dress up for no one and light a candle and watch an old movie. I have a list of things I would like to do with you. It has not been a month or a week or four days. It has been my whole lifetime since I have seen you. I have sailed out to sea every morning, waking when it is still dark. The stars light against the cold sky, unraveling what my wiry hands had coiled up the night before. It has been too long, so long, that I did not know you until I met you and said goodbye again to you. A lifetime without your friendship. I would like to see you but I would like to have been alone for these many years. Alone gives me strength, stability, and clarity in my direction. I have tried on different loves and thrown them off, and others have tried my love and tossed me off. Nearly all have been good and kind or shallow but fun, and I have appreciated all of them, if perhaps only for a season, and they perhaps have appreciated me and we are still friends, if still in touch. But they did not make me dream again in excitement and simultaneous fear of loss that is gratifying and humbling. I would like to travel with and without you and sail with and without you and date you for those same years. A pleasure to spend a morning dancing like children to an old song while I make breakfast and you make coffee in wide off-white potter's mugs with blue rims that say all done at the bottom. I would like to do many things before we should ever call this anything. For when we touch the earth, we touch a foundation of interdependence and impermanence both. For we build this castle in the sky and space. We are what stars or trees or streams are, and stars or trees or streams are what we are. And if things come together, if only for a moment or an eon, it is the same. 
It is a warrior's love song you and I can sing in the shower. I would like to remember that you and I, we began things properly, slowly, deliberately, in the old way, as if we meant it. A love story as maddeningly, maddeningly slow as the Japanese tea ceremony, taking off our bamboo sandals, entering a tiny house, our robes cinched just too tightly, our hair combed, our eyes clear, whisking the green thick tea, pouring spring water, my left hand shaking, your cheeks blushing. Our getting to know one another has flowed through all available channels. We have been pen pals, our courtship has been excitedly careful, messaging on Facebook, Skyping, cell phone, an air visit to you, a road visit to me, a postcard on my refrigerator. I would like to go for a walk with you in the equinox rain through the old neighborhood with the noble houses and spacious yards. I walk slowly and you walk quickly. I offer you my white woolen blue striped sweater, but the rain is light and cool, so it does not bother you. I am wearing a cowboy shirt. I would like to remember our early days when we talked to one another but did not know one another, strangers in love, talking and laughing and sitting up straight and slumping and growing comfortable as ourselves with one another, all before sex seals something and intimacy is gained and space is lost, then regained. Yes, I would like sex. I would like to fall in love. I would like to think ahead. But I would like to be here now even more because here is where you are. I would like to begin things properly, for if I respect this match, then I must begin things with the three kinds of confidence, without hesitation. So rouse that insight. Be decisive. Know what is. See clearly. These are the three kinds of confidence. Chugim Trungpa. And so I would like to come in from the sea, and I would like to see you every day, but not all day. I would like to I would like you to have space and be alone, and then I would like to live our list. We can bicycle with Red Dog along the bike path, along the creek, and we can climb, yoga, run together through those mountain foothills hit hard by the floods. I do not know you, you worry sometimes. Am I too bold? Is this crazy? And that is a sane question, and I am glad you ask it. When it is dark and you have heard words of caution whispered in the wind from a friend who does not know me, you question our course forward. Then I remind you in easy words that I am only me. I am not what you fear. Your fear is what you fear. And I am something sillier, tougher. I am something more ordinary than what you fear. I am a basically good man, and I am happy to show my heart to your friends, and they are right to care for and protect you. I think that's probably enough. Reading from my book. So I'll just conclude with a reminder um, that love is not about getting rid of space, getting rid of being alone. Being alone, rather, the opposite, is about making friends with that aloneness. And then you're ready for a relationship that isn't codependent, but is about appreciation and admiration and that we can enjoy our space and our in, in, in independence and not suffer from the kind of claustrophobia or kind of controlling territoriality that can happen in relationships. A relationship, from a Buddhist point of view, is an opportunity to ally, to be friends with someone and help one another down the path of life to be a benefit to all sentient beings. So, you know, we all have friends who get together and then they kind of disappear. A relationship shouldn't be an excuse to forget about the world and to forget about being of service. A relationship should be a help uh, and an ally to being of service and to uh, society generally. So as we say in Buddhism, turn the flower outward. The flower of love is for the whole world, not just the couple in question. All right, I hope that was fun and helpful. Uh, I found all this Buddhist teaching stuff fun and helpful. And that's where I'm offering it from, not from the point of view of an expert, but from the point of view of someone on that path, which makes me an expert and makes you an expert. We uh, know our own path and our own life and our own experience better than any book. And as they say in Buddhism, always trust the principal one. And the principal one is you. <laughs>